is such a privilege to be here and to see so many fantastic faces here at this event. And it's also a privilege and an honor just to be surrounded by these four esteemed financial minds. Thank you all for being here. So given this is the macro and asset allocation panel for today, I feel it's only right that we start with a collection of charts. So here's a collection of charts. We start with this one. This is global interest rates over the last 40 years. And I guess while you may be forgiven for thinking that interest rates have soared over the last couple of years, the truth is we have been in a structural decline for a long time. Because as you can see on this chart, the Australian interest rate 40 years ago was 12.5%. It's now 4.1%. In the US, it was 9 and 3 quarters. Today, it's just over half that. In the UK, it was 9%. It's now 5 and a quarter. And in Japan, it was 5.5%. And yet, rates in that country have actually been negative since 2016. So let's put this all now into context with the next two charts. So first up, we have Australian equities versus bonds. And what do we notice here? Equities have really outperformed bonds in this country sustainably over the last 25 years. And then in contrast, you've got global equities versus bonds. And what do we notice here is that equities really at the global level, at that mid and large cap level, have only really outperformed since 2017. And between 2018, sorry, 2008 and 2016, bonds were actually outperforming. And the last shot is a little bit of fun. This is a Google Trades readout of the terms hard landing and soft landing in the financial press. Now, obviously, this term has really come into proliferation early, really since 2020. But if you actually look in that 2022 to 2023 period, the two times that soft landing mentions peaked was also the peak for the S&P 500. So you can take that how you will. All right, let's put this all into context. We'll start now with the panel, and Andrew, I might start with you. We'll just go one way around. If we look at all these interest rate hikes that we've had in the G20 plus Australia, I think it's something in the neighborhood of 5,500 basis points worth of rate hikes. What effect has that really had on financial markets? Well, I, you know, I mean, it's the obvious um, thing that you'd expect is there's the discounting effect or, you know, the impact that should, the impact that should have is the further, you know, growth companies should be impacted in their valuations are more strongly than the rest. But interestingly, the exact opposite has happened. And I think if you look at history, that actually is pretty consistent. Um, I think, you know, what we're, we're really yet to see what the impact is, and that will be uh, the delayed reaction to corporate earnings that, you know, we're used to seeing 18 months uh, to two years after those rate hikes. Um, and the situation as we are now is a bit confused to a normal cycle because we've had this pandemic boom and bust. So we're seeing a lot of bad earnings, but a lot of them relate to the pandemic bust, the boom and bust, rather than perhaps the broader economies, which are, you know, outside of China are looking pretty good. So I think really the, the, the issue is the impact rates have on equities is really how they impact earnings and we're yet to see it. Martin, do you share that view? The impact of interest rates rises has been broadly less than expected on other asset classes. I would have thought that things would, bonds have adjusted, equities, real estate, et cetera, generally have adjusted less. So that's how I'd summarize it. Why is that the case? I think in part, it's the extent and duration of that interest rate decline cycle that you pointed to earlier. Behaviors have become so ingrained over very long periods of time that those people are letting go of those they're, they're not letting go of them easily. So whether it's real estate, as Jeremy talked about, whether it's growth stocks versus value, as Andrew was touching on, all of those behaviours in my mind have become so ingrained that people are very reluctant to let them go. Well, it's hard to let go of something free when you've been given it for a long time. Uh, Alex, do you share that view or do you take a, a different angle on this? Look, I might have a slightly different view given we are... Um... We are multi-asset investors, so um, uh, you know, in a holistic fashion, of course, there is the the discount rate impact um, on just equities. But I would say that probably from a uh, consumption and earnings momentum, we we still riding what's left of the wave of the the post-COVID environment with a, a lot of uh, pent-up demand and some excess savings that is 
uh, being washed through. So we haven't felt really the pain here. Another thing is that I think both consumers and corporations have binged on cheap debt and front-loaded a, a lot of their needs in terms of debt in the last couple of years. So there hasn't been a lot of refinancing so far, and we haven't felt that pain yet uh, entirely. I would say from a multi-asset standpoint, what it changes though from here on is the relative value uh, between assets. And as you might know, for, for a lot of you, we've seen this chart uh, all around where you know the earnings yield, which is the opposite of the price to earnings ratio on equities is now more or less on par with what you get in terms of yield for an investment grade bond in the US or even a cash deposit. So clearly it makes investors rethink their investment from here on because it means that equities have to deliver a lot from an earnings standpoint to justify the excess risk versus those safer asset classes. Yeah, I'm sure Nadal will come back to that point on the indifference and asset allocation or the indifferent opportunities of the now. Deanna, what are you using? In terms of all the rate rises that we've had and the impact to either share market, if you remember last year, the US share market did have a 25% correction. And yes, we have recovered a lot of that, but there was that initial drop and there is still the risk of what a cup we are. We probably have only seen the very start of the impact of rate rises, but you can also see the impact on the consumer, the retail environment at the moment here in Australia. I think you could call it a recession. We've had retail volumes that have been negative for the past three quarters. We've had we have housing supply in Australia that's running 15 or 20 percent below where it was a year ago. That's surely an impact of all these rate rises that that we've had. And there is going to be more to come. But at the same time, that first chart that you put up, Hans, shows that we have just had a normalization in interest rates. We haven't gone back to anywhere, I guess, really near long-term normal levels in, in rates. So if we see a further increase to interest rates, then there's going to be more pain, but it doesn't look like that's going to happen. Deanna, you and, 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 and Dr. Shane Oliver have an, an interesting view in terms of where the, the RBA will take rates. I understand that you've got a view that there might be one rate cut a quarter next year, starting in that first quarter. Can you just walk us through that thesis? Why is that? It's really around our view that inflation is going to surprise to the downside and that consumers are not as resilient as what most people expect them to be and that the accumulated savings argument is more or less over. If you look at where all those accumulated savings are for consumers, it's really in the older households that are probably going to conserve those savings for retirement or they don't need to draw down on those savings because they're not the ones that are being impacted by rising interest rates. And there are some risks to inflation in the near term. Commodity prices have been rising, food inflation. El Nino is probably going to see a bit of an increase as well. Real wages growth is increasing, so you could see some upside to, con to consumer spending again. But I do think that inflation will surprise even the RBA's own forecast to the downside, and, and it has in the past few months. So I think in that environment, we can see some rate cuts. I don't think that a 4.1% interest rate is sustainable in, a, in Australia, given where household debt levels are. If household debt levels were much lower, then the average household with a mortgage could sustain its current mortgage payments. But Mortgage payments and share of income are, have, are going to rise to a record high. I don't think that we can we can sustain the current level of interest rates here. All right. Well, we'll come back to the housing and debt conversation a little later, but I really just want the panel's view on what was Deanna saying. You know, do, do you think we'll see rate cuts in, in 2024? And maybe, Alex, I'll start there with you. Go this way around. Yeah, I think well, our views are, um, are relatively similar, probably. Where we differ is that our macro team expects that we get one more hike in November, um, given uncertainties and, and upside pressure around wages and sticky um, sticky rents uh, in Australia. But beyond that, into next year, we think around the month of August, the RBA should have enough certainty that um, you know inflation's running around three percent or less on an annualized uh, basis or, or quarterly annualized basis. 
And by then, there'll be a bit of cut, right? So we're seeing uh, two cuts in the second half of next year as well, based on the deceleration also of the economic activity. At the That's interesting, actually. We've got rate cuts starting in the first quarter next year, and Alex is talking about actually one more hike before we even get there. Martin, do you share that view, or where are you on interest rates? Interest rates are a very blunt tool and arguably aren't solving the problems that we have. So as Jeremy was saying, wealth inequality, housing, all of those issues are the issues facing most economies and Australia is no different. I think that one of the things I find most interesting are demographics, population, how they're shifting around the world, aging populations. Interest rates aren't doing what they did back in the 1970s and a long period of declining interest rates transferred most of the wealth from young to old and interest rates now are actually exacerbating that problem. They're transferring more wealth from the young to the old, and uh, which is which is why I'd look at it and say uh, the very simplistic response of saying inflation's high, put up interest rates, is not giving the right answer. And we're now having the situation where wages are probably creating most of the inflation pressure. The young are demanding wage increases because they can't afford to live, and perversely hitting it with that stick of interest rates again will be the wrong answer. The wage increases are in part the response to that wealth inequality. And uh, so uh, while not disagreeing and a long-winded answer, I'd, I'd say I'm not sure that interest rates are proving the right tool. They are a blood tool and I'd, I'd probably say that right, raising interest rates further will not be the right solution. Yeah, but okay. Andrew, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I, I agree broadly that probably, and I'm giving that like slightly more than 50%, that we're near the top of the cycle of rates. Maybe there'll be one more, two more, but you know, I don't think there's going to be anything dramatic. But I, I think the real question here looking forward is not whether we get another rate rise or not. It's like, how deeply can they be cut? And I think that's where I have a problem because, I, and you know, I'd probably focus more on the US here, is that um, we're at a point here we got, the US economy is, is pretty much booming. I mean, I think that's a fair description. And yet we have the government deficit there. I think we've got a chart of this one um, of, you know, the government deficit is hitting 8% at the peak of the economic cycle. So it's um, like, that's an extraordinary position. And, and what you're seeing, I think, and, and potentially keeps rates up higher and keeps inflation up higher is that governments are going to com be competing with the private sector for funds. Um, so I, I, you know, I don't think it really matters whether rates are cut 50 points or put up another 50 points. It's like, where are they going to be for the next five years? And I think on the balance probabilities, they're going to stay at these higher levels. Um, and it is a blunt tool, but it's the only tool governments think they have. And in the U S it's even worse because the tool doesn't work because of fixed mortgages. It doesn't work on the household that impacts the banking system. Well, okay, so you've got this chart here on on, on these on these U.S. deficits, right, and and the fiscal cliff that might be coming for the U.S. government. So, what does this say to you then about you know how you allocate assets, how you view maybe you know U.S. assets, given this is part of the backdrop? I think we work that you know long term, you know, interest rates, the most important one, the ten years are going to be, uh, you know at plus or minus 50 points from where we are today, but don't expect them to go back down to two. Don't expect short rates to get down to particularly low levels either. That would be the base case. All right. Martin, I want to pick up on what you were saying just now about, you know, interest rates being this blunt tool and now probably being more blunt than, than ever, really. So if, you, if you've got that assumption around interest rates and the role it plays, how does that assumption then affect where you see value? Probably like Andrew, I think that the experiment with easy money didn't go very well so that didn't solve any problems and it arguably created quite a few so we don't the the argument for ultra low and free money to to us has gone so all we're really arguing about is our equilibrium rates somewhere near where they are now or a little bit lower so that debate for us is we go back to some sort of normality uh, as Andrew was touching on too, when it comes to the stock market and a lot of asset pricing, the paradigm that was set in the era of easy money where multiples got crazy, people were paying for the, the hugely distant future in stocks because money was free, 
that paradigm has been surprisingly sticky and and taken some time to unwind. So we feel like that's the main thing that's got to normalise. If interest rates only go down a little bit, people need to get away from this idea of paying crazy prices for the distant future in companies because interest rates were, were super low. All right, so I take that view though. And then I contrast it with what you're saying, Deanna, about you know, about interest rates here in Australia and the fact that we could see one rate cut a quarter next year. So if you take that assumption around interest rates, you know, where, how does that affect where you see value and, and when you asset allocate at AMP? Well, in the, in the medium term, I think that there are good reasons to still expect interest rates to remain higher than where they were in the 10 years before the pandemic, but that wasn't really a normal period either because we couldn't get inflation above 2%, couldn't get wages growth up, fiscal policy didn't feature at all in the policy debate. And that was what was you know wildly needed. And if you think about the longer term drivers of inflation, so things like the aging population, both in Australia, but also across many of the other advanced countries, the decline in the working age relative to the older groups tends to be inflationary plus the climate issues which we know about larger government spending and more spending on defense uh, the collapse of globalization the move to a multipolar world where the us is no longer the dominant power in the global economy that all suggests to me that inflation will be higher than what than what we were than what we were used to in the 10 years before the pandemic. So yes, interest rates will probably be uh, at higher levels in the medium term, which I guess does push you towards a different asset allocation into more of a potentially defensive um, rather than growth mix in a medium term sense. I think that there is genuine reasons to believe that, but whether we need you know a 4.1% cash rate or not, I'm just saying that in the next 12 to 18 months, there's, I think, a good reason to believe that we will see a downturn here, maybe not a recession, but you know, a significant downturn that will be enough to get the RBA to cut. But you can still see interest rates you know, at around three or three and a half percent for the next few years, whereas we were used to much lower levels before the pandemic. Let's pass all those views then and let's ask our multi-asset manager here on the panel and, and Alex. Is there one underrated asset class that you think investors should be paying more attention to, given what everybody's you know said on the panel? Yes, and um, and uh, unfortunately, it's not the the six years asset class, but I, I think right now, um, because starting point matter for long term investing, and uh, as we said, we think that um, as well as as AMP, we think that interest rates are going to remain more elevated than what they were in the past. So your starting yield on bonds, on credit, on floating rate credit. The number of high quality debt instruments is relatively high right now, whereas your starting point on equities, especially US equities, IEPs is very high, which is negative. So it's good for bonds, it's negative for equities. So over the long run, on a risk adjusted basis, we think that um, we probably um, are benefiting from a better uh, starting point in, the fi- in many of the fixed income asset classes as well as uh, some selected uh, alternatives. So th- these are the sort of things that sh- people should look into, notwithstanding the fact that um, uh, some equity market will also yield a good returns, the ones that got to deliver on the earnings front. Yep. Okay. Um, that brings up a good point, actually. Deanna, I thought uh, this would be a good time to explain the chart you've actually brought along. I bring it up. There you go. Uh, this is investment returns over rolling 20-year periods in Australia. I'm just curious, wh- why did you select this chart and how do you think it ties into the conversation we've been having so far? Well, I liked it because I like long-term charts, generally because I'm an economist, so I guess I have to. But it shows you that since we've seen the structural decline in interest rates over the past few decades, you can see that the long-term returns on equities have gone down in line with the returns of cash and bonds. So if we if we continue, I mean, if, if, if interest rates remain elevated, as we expect, then I think you can reasonably expect that you're not going to see generally the same rates on equities like you have in periods where interest rates were lower. I mean, that's just a normal uh, type of DCF and analysis. So, um, but at the same time, this chart shows you that you still have to be invested in 
equities because despite all the fluctuations that you can have on a short-term basis, you can still see that they have performed very well on a very long-term horizon. All right. Thank you for that. So that's Australia. Why don't we take this conversation a little more global now? And Martin, this is actually where I'm going to introduce your chart because we're seeing a lot of different things happening in the Asia-Pacific environment, right? There's a lot of bad data coming out of China, which you're talking about in this chart. Then you've got Japanese stocks, which have had a, an enormous rally this year. And then you've got the other growth engine in India. So where do you think Australia sits in an ever-changing Asia-Pacific environment, Martin? And how are you trying to, to profit from it? I suppose one of the things I take out of this bunch of charts is just how many economies have reached extremes. So I find China interesting because it's almost the opposite to Australia. All their problems are they've built way too much housing over the, the last couple of decades. So land sales are collapsing, consumer confidence extremely low, and they haven't, despite their efforts, been able to build a consumer economy in China at all. We sit here in the Western world with exactly the opposite set of problems. We're generally importing labor from Asia as a supposed cure to aging populations and so on. That Don't get me started on that. But the, uh, the other issue, obviously, is we have, we have economies incredibly dependent on consumption. We, we do very little investment. The whole, most of the era, era of deflation was really about all of the goods manufacturer of the world being shipped to China. So the deflation was nothing to do with us, but we cut interest rates anyway. So we've got these massive extremes in economies and, and we look at it and think, I find it surprising that people are extrapolating all of those things rather than expecting some forces back towards equilibrium. We look at it and think it's more likely that things change. China's pretty disastrous at the moment, but arguably they do have the advantage that they've got lots of manufacturing capacity capacity, lots of housing, what they can't get people to do is spend on consumption goods. Okay. So you, okay. So you look at that chart and you talk about economic extremes. How do you then profit from it? Do you lean into companies, you know, at least in Australia that have exposure to China and to the Asia Pacific, or do you stay more local or, or how do you approach this from that investable angle? Generally, and obviously we're stock specific, but we're looking, I'm a contrarian by nature. So generally I'm looking for opportunity where people are running away. And at the moment, people are running away from China. They're generally running away from commodities. It's a bit stock specific. It's a bit commodity specific. So things like aluminum or aluminium, we think sentiment's really bearish and probably the things are more optimistic. Iron ore prices are still high. But again, we're looking to profit from things where people are being unrealistic, unrealistically pessimistic. Most of the time at the moment, that's in things like cyclical stocks. Everyone loves smooth and growing streams of revenue and they've been trained to pay outrageous prices for those in general as a contrarian i'd say look elsewhere and if you're prepared to accept some volatility as jeremy was saying on things like commodities in general there are far better returns to be had okay so that's one chart from the asia pacific and then we contrast it to this chart which alex has brought along and this is around japanese nominal GDP finally exceeding Chinese nominal GDP after really decades in, in the doldrums. But how, how do you, when you look at something like this, Alex, how do you then, you know, turn that into profits and turn that into investable ideas for Australian investors? Look, um, the, clearly what, he, what he's telling us is that the world is changing and, and you know, China fell into uh, outright deflation. Uh, in the last uh, GDP print, so I think it's it's a milestone, a negative one for uh, uh, for China, and it adds to the the long stream of issues that have been quite public. Now, I mean, I don't want to be the big bear on China. They're going through a, a restructuring uh, of their economy, and clearly, the high level of debt, the aging population, all these things uh, must be taken into account. There's probably an overcapacity in housing, etc. How how does translate into Australia, well, clearly, uh, maybe the opportunity set for us here in Australia will change. Maybe the, I'm um, speaking about commodities, the commodities that are tied to the, the more classic construction business will be less in demand coming out of China, but maybe it will come from somewhere else in the world because, you know, in the multipolar world, a lot of these production capacity coming out of China will be rebuilt in the Western world. So maybe the Western world 
will be hungrier. There is a very strong need for housing uh, construction in the Western world as well. Um, on top of that, there is also a very strong need uh, from the decarbonization and the greener energy for other type of commodities across the global world. So I think it's a shift. It's a shift in what um, the demand is in terms of uh, commodities and goods and services around the world. What it tells us as well is that um, you know countries that were traditionally exposed to China maybe will go through a, a softer patch. Uh, the reason also why we like this chart is that there is a structural improvement of the Japanese economy that has started uh, 10 years ago with the Abe uh, government. And we see that flowing through uh, to the um, to the equity market in Japan. And Japan is only exposed 4% uh, Japanese equities uh, to the, the, the Chinese uh, revenue. So it's also time, I think, to reconsider within the region where the opportunity, is, uh, opportunity set is and how the, uh, the environment is changing. Okay, good. I want to close this part of the, the, the panel with you, Andrew, if you don't mind. I know that you've been structurally, let's say structurally constructive on China and also on Japan. With that international aspect, how do you, how do you, you know, when you talk to Australian investors, how do you say these are where the profitable opportunities are? Well, let me pose to you a hypothetical situation. Mm -hmm. There's a stock market. It's down 50% from its highs of two years ago. Its economy is already in recession. Valuations look really attractive by historical standards. Interest rates are being cut and the government is stimulating, fiscal stimulus is plentiful and ongoing. Do you want to buy that market? I think I do. I just described China, obviously. What is being underplayed in China and not reported? Yes, the property property is a disaster, but there is huge stimulus underway and huge change in rules around uh, property sector with the goal of bringing buyers back in. And I, uh, even, even if you don't want to buy into that, um, when we talk about some of these bigger trends like you know, um, climate change, who dominates, who absolutely dominates the supply chain of everything we need for greening our economies? It's China. Um, sodium ion batteries, Jeremy mentioned, who, who's got sodium ion batteries in motor vehicles today? China. So I just think this is a huge opportunity. Japan is a nice opportunity. It's a bit different. And that is that I think GDP has got very little to do with the story. It's all about corporate governance, um, very badly managed companies and changes that are occurring now. I think it's a big opportunity. But I also look at global equity portfolios and it's not very hard to find my peers who have zero cent in Japan. Um, it's quite extraordinary position. So again, it's a massively under owned situation. Yeah, absolutely. It's Let's focus this conversation back on Australia and maybe something that Australians love to talk about, and that's housing and debt and those stories. Dion, I'll bring you back into the conversation. We talked about, obviously, the, the blunt tools of interest rates, but why do you think, from where you stand, why have interest rates not had the effect on housing and the debt cycle like maybe it once did? Well, they did initially. We saw a 9% correction or so in home prices here. That was about... I'd say half of what most people were expecting. We were ourselves looking for about a 15 to 20% fall. That, I think that became a consensus estimate by the end in terms of the decline peak to trough in home prices here in Australia. And it clearly, uh, we were clearly wrong because the population story rebounded much faster than when most people expected it to. It happened later than where most people thought it would. Uh, we reopened our economy in 2022 to the world and most people thought that we would get people coming back then but it really started only this year and our migration numbers are running at something like 450,000 people per annum which is a record level and that's created issues in the rental market the rental market is already in in such a tight position because we're not building enough homes housing supply 
has collapsed from the rise in interest rates. It's been one of the per- one of the points of rising interest rates that we've had this weakening in residential construction. So this this tightness of the rental market, along with the the overpopulation levels, I think that you could call it now, has allowed home prices to start rising at the same time. People are worried. They they have FOMO. They don't want to miss out on any of the rises. And if you're renting, you might think, well, the only thing that I'm missing is really being able to get into the market. And there have been some really interesting surveys that have been done recently that have asked people who have bought in the last few years if they've received any help from family, whether it's a guarantor or financial assistance. And more than 50% of people in one of these surveys that I was looking at have received some sort of help from family. So this is becoming more of a normal thing and it's a huge problem for inequality, but that's sort of the reality of the housing market that's been created by our policymakers here. And the only way around it is a massive correction in prices or a change in policy, whether that's taxation, changes to negative gearing, or a huge further increase to interest rates. But I think all those things are quite unlikely. So the inequality that we're facing in the housing market is just going to keep going. Martin, I wanted to give you a quick word on, on housing because I know you watch it closely. Yeah, I agree with all those things, Dan. I said that the, the issues in you know, Japan and China show you what happens when you have 100 houses and only 99 buyers. And the uh, in Australia, we've made an art of making sure there are 105 buyers for every 100 houses. And the the argument there of saying we've we've got a whole raft of policies that A, prop up price and B, ensure the, a shortage of supply so you get artificially high prices in an era where sustainability is supposed to be uh, an objective though, we find it surprising that somehow that doesn't apply to the Australian property market. At some stage, what you can't do is keep on propping up the price of outrageous houses which also prop up all the debt in our banking system too. So it is to us an issue where we can't keep on going with the policies and say, don't worry, it's okay, we'll just bring in more people to buy the houses. But the uh, the path is, I think everyone would agree, we've gone well past what is a sustainable level of housing prices and an imbalance in supply demand. And again, this comes back to what you were saying earlier, Deanna, right? I mean, like, how long can the Australian economy really put up with 4% plus interest rates? How long can the US consumer really put up with 5% plus interest rates? And that that's all part of the conversation. So we're coming close to the end of our time here on the panel. I wanted to give everybody one last say to this question. And it's something that Jeremy Grantham was really talking about in his excellent conversation with with James Marley. It's around this thing around wealth inequality. What do you think are some of the other unintended consequences of the surge in interest rates that have not already been mentioned? And maybe, Andrew, I'll start that with you. Yeah, it's... A, it's a... I mean, I think there are plenty of consequences that are not well noted. Um, You know, you look at the US banking system and, you know, the troubles of Silicon Valley Bank, uh, which came and went, but, you know, that's left the US banking system uh, quite hamstrung. It's created a very unusual circumstance in US housing where, um, you know, mortgage rates are up quite a bit more than bonds. Uh, People can't, because of the fixed interest rates, people can't afford to move. But that means if you do want to buy a house, your only chance is to buy a new home. So there's a boom, perversely, in a massive housing recession. There is a uh, a boom in new housing, which is an odd one, but it's helping keep the economy going as well. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I could go on, but I better stop. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's one important unintended consequence. I mean, you talk about you know how frozen the housing market is in the US. That, yes, that's your, your perfect symptom of it. Martin, what's another unintended consequence you think of this incredibly blunt tool? Well, I think the issue of social stability is probably the main one. Any economy has to rest on a relatively even spread of wealth, and we push that to extremes. And all companies, I think, are are probably, uh, they rely on that to keep going. So I think you're you're seeing a lot more government policy where the, whether it's bank taxes, the tall poppy syndrome, they're having to cut down and address some of those problems to try and even it out because interest rates aren't doing it. Things like the Google antitrust trial in the US, I think people have got a lot of expectations that because they look backwards, the history that they're used to will keep going. And I think it's far more likely that we are going to 
see a lot of change in that area where profits need to be taken from those over earning companies. Tech have cre- has created a lot of great things, but they've also created a lot of, you know, I need to go to San Francisco to find out what instability it creates. So all of those things to me would suggest that a lot of policies are going to be about chopping down some of those tall poppies and trying to reallocate and the expectation of investing in super profitable companies that they'll go on or upward will end up being wrong. Yeah, absolutely. Alex, what's what's one other unintended consequence for you? Uh, I think that we've seen yet a lot of um, uh, the, the impact um, in terms of asset valuation. I think uh, um, investors are now just starting to realize that interest rates are going to stay higher than where they were for longer. So a number of investors need to go back to their spreadsheet and revalue their assets. And that's something that's just started uh, in some industries like like real estate. But clearly, um, in US private equity and venture capital, you see that the hurdle rate for investment is now a lot higher and profitability is the key word. So I think it's going to change the way uh, we approach investments in the year forward as well. Dan, I'll give you the last word. I have a few, and Alex kind of took the one that I was thinking of the most, really. That's okay. Non, in terms of non-residential property, and obviously that's been hit by COVID and working from home, which has had a much more longer-term impact. But if then I could think of another one, it would probably be the impact to budgets and budget deficits, um, like the chart that Andrew had before in terms of the US budget deficit now. It was on the right path, and now it's gone back the complete other way because one of the largest growing components of budget deficits, whether it's here, whether it's here or in the US, is interest expense. And we, this is, we're just kind of at the beginning of this because um, of the way that government borrowing works and interest rates. And if we continue to see interest rates remain elevated, which we think that they will, then this will just continue to be a much larger share of borrowing for every government and that creates less opportunities for spending on other areas and that means that potentially bond yields may even need to move higher both here and overseas that is a terrific note to end our conversation on it has been a terrific conversation i hope you've all enjoyed it a big thank you to andrew clifford to martin conlon to alexandra ventola and to deanna messina one great big round of applause please (laughs) 